So welcome again. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so a few different topics we're going to cover tonight, but with the whole kind of general realm of kind of managing your maple operation. And there's a few topics or a couple topics that I just wanted to um, wrap up that we kind of ran out of some time in some previous presentations. So um, we'll kind of try to wrap everything up tonight and answer any questions that you might have. And so um, first, I want to kind of just wrap up uh, our most recent presentation thinking about actually turning that sap into syrup. And so we got through, you know, we talked about the flavor of maple syrup, concentrating that. We went over reverse osmosis. We went over, you know, turning that into syrup, uh, filtering that. And so the last kind of step is thinking about um, bottling and labeling uh, your maple syrup. And so going over kind of some laws and regulations. Um, if you make maple syrup for your own personal use and you're not selling it, there's really no regulations typically that applies um, for maple production because you're just doing it at home, using it yourself, if you're even giving it away to friends. But when, when you start actually selling it, then there are some regulations that sometimes that typically come into play. Uh, one of the biggest things is just following the standards um, for maple syrup. So it conforms to the standards of identity for maple syrup. And the biggest one is making sure that it's Cook to the correct density, that that is 66% to 68.9% sugar. In Nova Scotia, that's your standards that density that needs to be. We went over that last time. Um, you also need to make sure that there are no off flavors, that it has the standard typical flavors of maple syrup, and then it needs to be filtered. Um, so having filtered maple syrup, and then you need to follow your preventional label laws and uh, grading laws that are there. And so um, for Canada, grade A pure maple syrup, um, again, it has that density of 66 to 68.9%. Um, then, you know, different ways you can test that. Uniform in color, free from any sediments, any cloudiness or turbidity. So there's your um, making sure it's filtered. Has a color class as determined according to um, the grade standards that I'll show you. Um, and then it has that flavor and characteristics that are the flavor that's characteristics of that color class that's there. Um, and so no odors or foul tastes that are there. Um, so that's the kind of the standard of identity sort of for maple syrup in Canada. And um, so we're thinking about the general um, labeling laws and you can look into this if you want to clarify specific things for your area for Nova Scotia. Um, but these are kind of the typical things. Um, when I looked up for what Nova Scotia should have and what's typical for most um, regions, areas, um, provinces, and states. So the biggest one is the commodity entity that it's, you know, pure grade A maple syrup. Um, so the name, um, having that on the label. I also put in birch syrup in here as well, just as a contrasting, just showing that even for other agricultural products. So the commodity identity, so that it's maple syrup, or in that case is birch syrup. So the quantity, what's the actual weight or volume that you have? So 17 ounces or 500 milliliters or whatever um, that you're using. Um, so that quantity has to be there. That usually has to be on the front panel. And then somewhere on the label, you have to have your name, your manufacturer's name or um, and address um, that's on there. So not usually just a website address, but actual physical address um, that's on that. Um, packaging as well. And then you need to have the, the grade, um, which birch syrup does not have a grade, but for our maple syrup, as we see in the bottom here, is dark color, robust taste. Um, for, um, I was looking up that if you are, uh, as long as you're not producing a large, large quantity, um, I'm trying to remember what the exact cutoff is, but it's quite significant. Um, and it's based on monetary value, you don't have to have a nutrition fact panel um, for on a smaller scale for this. Um, and so thinking about the actual maple syrup grades, there's four different grades of maple syrup. Um, and these are a standardized identity across the United States and Canada now. Um, there used to be different grade standards for different states and different provinces all kind of had different grade standards. So the industry worked together a little over 10 years ago now and actually created these 
standardized grade um, for this. And so that's referring to the different color classes that you get based on, if you think back to our last presentation, when we we're talking about, you know, it's usually typical different times of the year, and it had to do with the different um, invert sugars or those reducing sugars. If we got more fructose, there was more Maillard reaction or caramelization that happened. Or if we got more amino acids, more of that Maillard reaction was also happening that you get stronger, darker flavored syrups. And so the reason why we do these different grades is that um, having different grades is helpful for the consumer. Because if you're a consumer that came and got the really light golden syrup, um, and that's what you're used to, but then you went and bought a dark or very dark syrup from somebody and it was still just labeled as maple syrup, then you're going to be kind of confused. Like what's wrong? Why, what's, um, what's different about this? And you're probably not going to be happy. Um, cause these differences can be, I mean, it's still maple syrup, but there can be some pretty drastic differences between those flavor profiles. Um, and so by grading them to these color classes is helpful for the consumers. There's also some confusion with it among consumers. It takes some education because they don't always know the difference always. Um, and everybody has their own preference. Some people like the really light syrup. Some people like the darker syrup. I have some customers that love like the very dark, the stronger it is, the better, um, especially if you're doing a lot of cooking and baking with maple syrup, the darker is typically better because that stronger flavor profile comes through. Um, so the new grade standards is the lightest one is golden color with a delicate taste. Then it's amber color with a rich taste. Then dark color with a robust taste. And then the last one's the very dark with a strong taste. And this is um, graded technically based on the amount of light transmittance that shines through. Um, so if you shine a light through it, um, the amount of light that's able to transmit through that um, the solution through the syrup. And so golden color is based on that 75% or more of the light can shine through it. Amber is between 50 and 75. Dark is between 25 and 50%. And then anything below 25% is very dark maple syrup. Um, and the way we measure this is there's a couple couple different ways. There's a few different tools. I'm showing the two most common here. Um, one is the um, this physical uh, temporary grade kit. They're called um, temporary grade kits because um, they have these different colored solutions um, that are typically a glycerin with some dyes that darken them. And then you have an empty bottle that comes. And so you fill the empty bottle, you put it into this little wooden rack that came with, that way you're just looking at that circle. You're not, your eyes not being obscured by the roundness of the corners of the bottle or anything like that. And you kind of hold it up to the light and you're comparing to the sample next to it and you can move these around. So if you're looking, is it lighter than this lightest one? If it's lighter than that, then it would be a golden syrup. But if it's darker than this, then you can move it over and compare it to the amber color. So this light one is right at 75% light transmittance. So if it's lighter than that, that's in the golden. The middle one here is uh, at 50% light transmittance. So it's right at that bottom threshold of amber. So anything lighter than that, but darker than the golden at 75 would be the amber syrup. And then this one down here on the right would be 25% 25%, yeah, 25 light transmittance. So anything lighter than that 25 or darker than the 50%, the amber one would be the dark syrup. And then anything darker than this one uh, would be the very dark. So there's no reason to have all four of them because anything darker than that would just be very dark syrup. So these you just visually um, compare side by side. It can be subjective, depending on the light a little bit more, but they can get pretty close, but um, they're called temporary kits because over time that glycerin can actually fade and lighten um, the colors that are in there. And so they're usually only good for two or three years. Um, and then you need to get a new one because the color, the light of them will actually change over time. Whereas um, these instruments like the HANA checker um, that actually you fill one of these little bottles. Um, there's You get one reference bottle that's a clear liquid. Uh, clear glycerin that goes in and you calibrate it so it shines a little light through and it calibrates so that's 100% and you check it and make sure it's 100% of the light goes through it you know that's 100% and then you have an empty bottle you can fill with your sample of syrup and it's only like uh, 10 milliliters I think so it's a really small amount 
you put it into there, close the lid, hit the, bu the button, and then it reads. It's actually shining that light through it to read the light transmittance, and then it gives you the number. So in this particular case in the picture is 63%, um, which would be above 50 and less than 75. So if we look back at our chart, between 50 and 75 would be an amber color, rich tasting uh, maple syrup, which is majority of where maple syrup is typically made anyways, is typically in that amber color, rich taste. Um, the Hannah Checker does have a little bit of discrepancy. Uh, I think it's can be sometimes off by about 4%. Um, so if you're on the edge, um, you can be what I like. If it's on the edge, I typically like to go by taste. Does it have more of a lighter taste or a darker taste? And then grading it based on that. Um, if you're storing maple syrup in plastic jugs, it will actually darken over time. And a lot of times can darken within a month um, and can drop sometimes a whole grade. So if you had an amber grade of maple syrup a month or two later, it might actually be darker. Um, any studies done so far, the flavor doesn't seem to change um, in the jugs, but the it will definitely darken um, over time, especially the lighter grades of syrup. You've got a golden syrup can definitely darken a little bit um, over time. Glass bottles are a little less likely to happen. Um, it can, if glass bottles are, of maple syrup are stored in direct sunlight, like on a windowsill or something for a long time, they can lighten over time, get bleached out, um, but they're a little bit more stable. But the plastic, because plastic is technically still kind of semi-porous, it's not a complete enclosed, and so there's some oxygen exchange that can happen, and that's what actually darkens that syrup in the bottle. Um, any questions on the grades that are there that I'm mentioning? Feel free to throw questions in the, the Q&A um, on that. Um, and then the, the last grade of maple syrup, so we have our four, what we call our grade A or table grade syrups. Um, the last one is processing grade uh, maple syrup. And so this is maple syrup that can be sold, but it cannot be sold for retail um, and retail containers directly to a consumer. Um, this is sold for uh, food processing or non-food uses. So used in making sausages or bacon um, or pet foods and things like that, granolas um, that still can be, you know, maybe okay when blended with enough other products so they can say that there's maple in there. Um, it has less of a value, about half the value typically uh, depends on this um, type of processing grade that you have. Um, so there is value in it. This is the stuff that's typically made at the very end of the season. Um, doesn't matter what color grade it is, any light transmittance, um, so any color class, um, but it can have a variety of off flavors, whether it's burnt or buddy syrup at the end of the season, sour syrup, um, really strong tasting. Um, it is important that it's still, you want to have the correct density so that it's able to store and doesn't spoil. Um, or doesn't crystallize. And then it usually has to be sold in large containers. So if you're only making a gallon or two of it, um, people who are buying it, so there's um, people called packers in the industry or buyers who will buy it, and then they have accounts with these large food manufacturing operations. Um, so those large bulk buyers, they're not going to want to handle it. Um, they usually want you know, at least five gallons or more, 20 liters or more um, containers. So that's processing grade syrup. Um, and so where do those off flavors come from? You know, this goes back to what we mentioned last time about the human activity of, you know, maybe not having clean filters, whether it's in our sap or in our syrup, if we're using those filters that have off flavors or we're not processing our sap as quickly and it's sitting around and getting kind of off colored. So, um, you know, the picture on the right is still pretty clean. These ones on the left in the middle are starting to get some off colors to them in that sap. Not too bad, though. Those would probably still be okay. But a lot of times sitting in your tank, sitting around too long, um, your, you know, density, again, being off a little bit, um, if it can spoil more. Um, the filters, as I mentioned, handling your sap, not cleaning as enough, or uh, holding around too long, not cleaning your tanks. Um, and so that it's picking up more microbes that are going beyond the good fermentation that we want and getting um, too much fermentation or getting the anaerobic fermentation I mentioned last time that's going to give sulfur flavors into it. 
if you're the the deep foamers that I mentioned, if you use way too much of it, that can give off flavors. You can actually get maple syrup that can have some kind of waxy taste that it kind of leaves in your mouth from the deep foamers. Um, if you're boiling it um, too intensive heat or overcooking it or cooking it too long, like in a batch method, if you cook way too long, um, you can scorch the sugars if you get too hot. And so a scorched sugar flavor um, is not all that desirable. And that happens when you get a lot of the invert sugars in there. Um, so late in the season, our very dark syrup tends to have a little bit of that scorch flavor anyways, but if you get too intense, that's not going to be great. And depending on how you're storing it, um, you know, again, if you're not um, storing it at the correct density, but also, but more importantly, not storing it in the hot um, containers as we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, the biggest thing to remember is that we're concentrating sap, you know, at least 40 times typically. So any little slight off flavors or anything that happens in that sap, we concentrate that and we're intensifying that flavor even more. So it's be, it's really important to be careful in how you handle your sap, how you deal with it to make sure we get good quality syrup. Um, that's important to keep in the marketplace. So kind of the last piece in finishing kind of the, the part of um, the maple processing is actually bottling or canning our maple syrup. And so um, depending on the scale that you're doing, you might be doing this straight off of the evaporator um, or off of your finishing pan, or you might be doing this, um, as you can see in this picture where we have these big barrels um, that we're putting maple syrup into these large barrels, but we're still we're basically canning it that way too. We're still doing it hot um, into these big barrels. And then later on throughout the year, so most of our large producers are put into big barrels because we don't have time to fill little barrels or little bottles. Um, and then throughout the year as needed, then we'll fill little bottles or we're selling it bulk um, in those big barrels. So when it comes to bottling, um, we must hot pack it. And we want to do that in clean food grade containers. You don't want to use any type of container that, you know, you can repurpose containers, but be really careful about what you use. Obviously it needs to be food safe. So no, you know, anything that had detergents or um, cleaners or oil cans and things like that, obviously, hopefully that's a given um, that you're not using anything like that, especially even barrels, making sure that they're, you know, just food grade. Um, but even when it comes to food grade, it's important to be careful with what you use um, in that it doesn't have any smells or flavors from whatever product was in there before. So like a mayonnaise jar, you know, is going to have oils and things that can easily get into there. Peanut butter jars might leave behind um, flavors. And also there could be an allergen issue if you're selling or giving maple syrup for somebody who has a peanut allergy. Definitely want to be careful with that. Um, as an example, when I used to make maple syrup on a small scale and, you know, reusing some jars I had around, one time I used a couple um, pasta sauce, tomato sauce jars that I had that, you know, I had cleaned them with soap and everything, but they were pretty good. But there was actually still like a tomato-y sauce smell in even in that glass jar. So glass is typically pretty good, you know, better than plastic. Um, but that still had that kind of tomato-y smell a little bit that got into, you now then I had tomato smelling maple syrup. I still ate it and consumed it because um, I didn't want to throw away because it was a lot of work and I didn't make that much, but um, that was something I didn't do again. And on a more recent note, I just had something that had some peach cider in this nice glass growler container. And so instead of using a plastic jug, I was like, well, I can reuse this to fill maple syrup for my own home use. It wasn't not to sell, but um, so I actually just opened that the other day. I had filled it like a month ago or so when I was doing some bottling and I opened it just a couple of days ago. And and I was afraid it might happen. And sure enough, like it has kind of a bit of a peach flavor in that maple syrup. Now, that's not the worst thing in the world. It's better than tomato sauce or mayonnaise flavor, um, having a little peach flavor in maple syrup, but it still changes this. Now it's, you know, has that off flavor. You definitely would not be able to sell that. Um, so you definitely want to be careful. Um, so Megan threw in a question. So no previously used mason jars. Um, you can. Um, so, I mean, mason jars are great for storing maple syrup. Just the biggest thing is do the sniff test. You know, if they don't have any off smells, um, you know, mason jars are typically pretty good. You know, it's odd that some glass jars, you know, especially if you ran them through a dishwasher and they smell okay, then it's probably okay. 
Um, so the biggest thing, you know, if you've got a mason jar that has been used before at home, you know, and you've, as long as you just, you know, if it, you smell it and it still smells like pickles, then I wouldn't use it. Um, pickled flavored maple syrup doesn't sound that great, although in certain things it could be good, I guess. But, um, but just smell it and see what it's like. You know, if it doesn't smell, if it still has some kind of food flavor, not great. But if it smells clean, doesn't really have any odor to it, then go ahead and use it. So great question. All right, so how we fill our container is really important. Um, and the biggest thing is that we want to hot pack them, as I said. So we call it bottling or we call it canning because we are literally canning it. We're not doing a hot water bath or pressure canning anything, but we are filling that. And the reason we fill them hot is so that's going to sterilize the maple syrup because maple syrup is 66 to 68.9% sugar, right? And so at that level, there's still over 30% water content within that maple syrup. And so at that level, um, there is a possibility of mold growth to form within maple syrup. So we're not like honey. Honey is higher. That's over 80% uh, sugar typically. And so at that higher level, um, you know, you're not going to get, you can keep it at room temperature or, and it's not going to mold on you, but maple syrup is just still has some water content within it. Um, it's harder for molds and yeast to form in that much sugar. Um, but sometimes we can get like a little bit of water. You won't really notice it, but we'll pull kind of on the top of the syrup. And that's where you'll get mold that can form if you don't hot pack your containers um, and store that properly. So as long as we hot pack maple syrup, then we can store it in theory indefinitely. You know, as long as we hot packed it in those canned it in those containers, once it's open, maple syrup should be stored in the refrigerator and the refrigerator, it should be fine indefinitely plastic containers especially it can dry out maybe a little bit and get some sugar crystals in the bottom because some of the water is sort of evaporating in your fridge out of the bottles even with the lid on um, over time but um, it should be fine you shouldn't get mold if it's stored in a refrigerator occasionally it sometimes happens but typically um, it's fine so the biggest thing is that we our minimum temperature is 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 82 and a quarter degrees Celsius. That's the minimum temperature that you want to heat your maple syrup up to that temperature. So if you're coming off of a finishing pan or evaporator, you know, you're going to be at that temperature. So you're fine, but you want to make sure it doesn't cool down below that temperature before you fill it. Um, if it is, you just want to reheat it and keep it at that. Um, so this is going to be after you filter that you're putting into your bottles, right? And so you're going to filter it. And so if your filtering is cooling it down, you may need to heat it up a little bit more. Um, and so getting it up to at least that 82.25 degrees Celsius. You want to be careful, though, and emphasize that it's not like, well, all right, I'll just throw it on the burner and get it up and make sure, you know, want to make sure I kill everything. I'm going to get it up to a nice big boil. If you get it up too high a temperature, you're going to... Um, once you, if you start boiling that syrup again, you're going to get minerals that are going to precipitate out. And we're going to get more of that sugar stand, and now your syrup's not going to be as clean. So after we filter, you know, we want to make sure that it's warm above 82 and a quarter degrees Celsius, but we don't want to get above like 91, 92 degrees Celsius. You know, if you get um, closer to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, even before you get to 100 degrees Celsius, uh, it is going to, you're going to start to get minerals precipitating out. And now you're going to have that nitre in the bottom of your bottles and your syrup's not going to be as clean anymore. Not that it's terrible, it can still be consumed fine, but you just want to be careful not to get too hot in that. So that's pretty important. So making sure it's hot packed. And so when you're filling bottles, you want to make sure that your bottles are at least room temperature. You don't want to bring in bottles from the barn or sugar house that are cold, you know, if it's a really cold day and then you put in hot syrup, but it might not, um, that glass container or whatever that's cold, um, it could cool down the syrup before it can sterilize everything. So we're not just sterilizing the syrup, we're also sterilizing the inside of the container as we put that syrup into it. So we wanna make sure that that syrup has contact for you know at least 30 seconds on the inside of the container in your lid 
at at least that 82 and a quarter degree Celsius so that it can actually sterilize the inside of our bottle as well. So if you, especially in big bottles, it doesn't matter too much, but especially these smaller bottles, um, like you see in the picture on the left, the, the ones that aren't filled, those little 50 milliliter bottles, if those are, you know, pretty cold and you put hot syrup into it, there's a lot of, there's cold glass with very, very little syrup, and it's going to drop the temperature on that really quickly and not be able to sterilize them. That's a big issue with these little ones. Some people will actually put these in like a water bath to try to warm them up or put them in the oven. Um, I do that sometimes when I'm filling little bottles. I'll put my oven on just warm um, to keep it at a lower temperature. And, you know, at that temperature, you can a lot of times just take the whole cardboard box and throw it right in a rack in the oven. Um, and it's not going to catch on fire or anything as long as it's low enough, but it'll just warm up those bottles. So when you put in uh, the syrup, uh, that it's not going to cool it down too quickly. So as far as actually ways to fill bottles of syrup, um, the um, maybe not the simplest, but the things that you may have easy on hand is just a funnel with uh, some kind of scoop or ladle to put it into. This is the most time consuming. Um, so, you know, if you only have a gallon or so, this works fine. Um, it's a bit of a pain, although if you're doing a little bit more. So if you want to step it up, one option that some people do is using one of these big kind of coffee makers, these uh, um, that are electric that you can usually plug it in and then you can maybe keep it warm. You want to make sure, again, you don't get too, too hot with it. Um, so if you can just kind of regulate it, turn it on and off as need be, but usually, you know, they have a little pour spout. So then you can kind of pour from there to, to put your maple syrup into the bottles. Um, so that can be handy, you know, kind of elevate it a little bit more for bigger bottles or have it hanging over the edge of a counter so you can fill. Um, you want to be careful though. I wouldn't recommend necessarily like just having it hanging over the edge of a, um, a counter potentially. Because if you have to hold a container, that maple syrup is going to be really hot and it's going to heat up that container and that's going to burn your hand potentially or be hard to hold. Um, you don't want to drop it. So you may not, you want to have something that you can rest the bottle on potentially. Um, another option is to get a pot that you can drill a hole and put some kind of little ball valve or a little spigot um, that you can kind of put that right onto your stove to warm it up. And then you can kind of, fill bottles right off of that pot um, on the bottom, or you can even buy like brewer's pots that sometimes have these anyways. Um, so there's some options out there. So that's a, a cheap alternative option. Um, if you want to step it up a little bit more, um, this type of system's pretty common for, you know, the somewhat smaller producers who are tapping a couple hundred trees or more. Um, this is a more of a commercial grade made for bottling unit, um, this canner. Uh, this particular system has a propane tank that you put underneath here. Here's your hookup hose. And then it has a propane burner underneath of it so that you have a heat underneath of there that's heating up that maple syrup. There's even a thermometer so you can measure the temperature. And then you've got um, a valve that would, you know, a ball valve that would screw into here for filled containers. It's got a shelf for putting your containers on and you can adjust this up and down. So those are handy. Um, the propane burner heats up the syrup quite quickly. So if your syrups, you know, is colder, you can heat it quite quickly. You want to be careful though, that it's a little bit more in direct heat. You don't want to be hitting it too hot that you're going to be evaporating more water, but also getting more of that sugar sand forming. I guess that's another thing I didn't mention. If you get, you know, start to boil again, water is going to evaporate and your density could become too high. Um, so it's also less, it's harder that to get that heat transmitted to be even all the way around, you might have to stir it a little bit or just keep it low so that heat can slowly transmit throughout the whole thing and not just be really hot at the bottom and not as warm at the top. Um, but uh, they're a little bit cheaper option if you want to buy an actual canning unit. And then beyond that, the other units, the more um, larger units use uh, usually a water jacketed canner. Um, so this here, this particular one holds a full barrel of syrup. And it has a water jacket all around the outside with these electric heat elements. And you can adjust that. And it takes longer to heat up syrup that way, but it keeps it consistently and it heats it up a lot more even with that hot water jacket around the outside. And then in this particular one, there's kind of two valves for manually filling bottles. Then there's, there's ones that get more sophisticated that have pumps that pump them through filling heads where you maybe can do four and you bring down a big lever on top of bottles and it will fill them. And there's kind of a, a feed 
And then there's also a return empty. So if it gets to the top, it starts sucking the syrup out. Um, so you don't overflow them or anything where these ball valves, if you don't pay attention and you look to the side, they can overflow easily. And also if you, these plastic jugs, especially glass is easier. You can see it filling up the plastic ones. You, it's hard to see where the top is until it, you're waiting, waiting, all of a sudden the syrup's right there. And if you don't catch it quick enough, you can over, you can spill easily. So, um, all right. And then the, the last step is once you fill a bottle is cap it and then flip it on its side and flipping on its side like this um, for at least 30 seconds or a minute is making sure that that maple syrup gets all the way up into the neck of the bottle and the cap and sterilizes everything. So we want to make sure everything gets sterilized. So, you know, you'll have an air pocket here, but when that syrup was filling up, and while you were capping it, that would have sterilized everything lower on the bottle. And then you flip it up so that hot syrup can get up around the neck and the cap. So that's an important step to make sure you do, you know, it's a mason jar or bottles like this or plastic jugs, flip it on its side. Be careful though, if you have a lid that doesn't maybe seal really, really well. Um, I've had some bottles before that, especially with the hot syrup, if it's there too much. Um, and if you have like a plastic lid, it can actually, it's not melting, um, but it's can start to warp uh, with the heat. The plastic can kind of mold a little bit and change shape and start to leak out. So some of them, you maybe hold it there for a minute, but then flip it back up so you don't keep it on its side because they can start to leak out. Most, most of them are fine though, but there's one particular bottle that I use that does that. Any questions on bottling maple syrup? All right, if no questions, if you do have some to think of as we move along, feel free to throw them in this chat. Um, so I want to move beyond that um, and kind of take a really a step all the way back and think about our actual trees and managing our maple trees and just present a few kind of topics and ideas on kind of some sugar bush management. Um, we're not going to delve into this too deeply. Um, if we do have our in-person um, we're going to talk about sugar bush management a little bit more. Um, and so I think everybody probably understands why it's important to manage our forest. Um, but just to, you know, to remember that healthy trees are making sure that we have those trees year after year. But also when we're looking at our canopy um, that, you know, it's all about the, the photosynthesis that's happening within our leaves. You know, oftentimes we get kind of focused on the maple season at the end of winter when sap's flowing and that's a really important time and that is really important um but what's also really really important is your growing season what happened this past season um for those trees how much did they photosynthesize how much canopy space is there um for them to be able to you know put out new leaves have large canopies um to produce a lot of sugars that we can collect, but also put on a lot of good growth so we can continue to tap those trees year after year and they're healthy and can, can, can continue to be tapped year after year. Um, you know, being able to manage our trees to create higher sugar is great, um, but ultimately we really wanna go for healthy trees. Um, and it's important to remember that forests are really these kind of living organisms that are going to, um, you know, they do die over time, you know, but there are storms that come in. There's, you know, ice storms, hurricanes, fires that can even come through hardwood forest um, that, you know, may kill some trees, but also might create gaps in the canopy to allow other trees to grow. And that there's, these are living organisms, they get impacted by that, um, but they can sometimes also respond to that. And it's important to try to create more of these resilient forests that are able to withstand some of the punches that may come from different invading um, factors or wind events. And so the invasive species or anything like that, so that they're healthy and be able to grow through that and don't die off from just one, you know, invasive pests coming through and chewing on the canopy of the leaves, like we see in the picture on the right-hand side. This was from some spongy moss coming through and defoliating the tree canopy, you know, completely. This was in early June um, when there should have been full canopy and that canopy is empty. Um, so creating these resilient, healthy forests that are active. Um, and what we want to avoid um, is this concept of the 
the multiple threats kind of decline spiral. And so when we when it does come to trees dying or senescing is that it's typically not one individual factor that kills a tree. You know, it's not that the spongy moth comes in and defoliates it and now that tree is dead. Um, but there's usually a combination of factors that lead to it. And so, you know, one of it starting out is, you know, if your trees are growing on really poor soils, you know, it doesn't have enough calcium for the trees or they're really compacted um, and it's not getting good water and airflow and nutrient flow within those soils, then those trees are going to be stressed. And so um, they're not going to be able to withstand that. You know, it's much like humans as well. If we're more stressed or we're tired, we're more likely to get sick potentially um, than if we're kind of healthy and rested up. So, you know, if you have trees that are stressed and then you have a spongy moth that comes through or other kind of you know, eastern tent caterpillar that defoliates, um, then it's harder for them to respond because they maybe don't have a reserve of sugars build up or energy build up um, to help push out new leaves because that, you know, from all the leaves that were just consumed. Um, you know, and then you have competing vegetation um, or some kind of other fungal pathogen that comes in and all these different factors kind of makes the tree kind of spiral down to its death or just overall decline within those trees. So that's why it's important to kind of keep healthy trees so that one individual factor is not going to harm the tree as much. Um, and so a lot of it comes back to keeping healthy soils. And remember that trees are um, really just a crop that we're growing on our soils. You know, soils are important, just like growing any kind of corn or tomatoes or strawberries, um, the soils that you have um, are important are going to be indicative of how healthy those trees are. And so soils are really our resource um, that's important to rely on. Um, and one thing I like to think about when we're or just kind of remind people when we're thinking about, you know, along the lines of soils is that thinking about our roots that are within those soils um, and how they're spreading out. And that a lot of times we think about the roots being kind of maybe the width of the canopy of the tree, what we call the drip line, um, we're on the edge of the canopy, if we thought of this as an umbrella, everything running down to here. But our roots oftentimes spread twice that distance. Um, you know, so for every, this is just our general rule of thumb, it's not perfect, but a lot of times for every one inch of trunk diameter, roots are spreading a couple feet in each direction. So if you have a 10 inch diameter tree, that's going to be reaching out like 20 feet. Um, so that's quite a big root spread. And most of those roots are within the top six inches of your soil within the forest. And so keeping that in mind, if you're out doing any work in your forest or collecting sap, that if you're running all around with a lot of equipment and creating ruts and tearing up, you know, some of that we need to do. And if we can keep that to certain roads and limited, but if we're doing too much of that um, with equipment and disturbing the soil and the roots, um, that's going to impact the health of those trees as well. Um, so the preferred soil that we want to have for maple trees is usually nutrient rich, especially our sugar maples. Red maples are a little bit more tolerant of poor nutrients, um, but our sugar maples really like nutrient rich soils. Um, high calcium especially, and they want it to be kind of moist, uh, but well-drained soil. So not completely dry, um, but not standing water. Again, red maples are a little more tolerable of really wet soils or, or wetter soils and drier soils as well. Um, so when we're thinking about our soils and that kind of nutrients, it's important to think about the pH of the soil. Um, so you're probably familiar with pH and maybe thinking about that in your garden. Um, for our maple, sugar maples, it's more ideal to be about a 5.5 to 6.8, um, somewhere in that realm. Forest soils are probably in Nova Scotia are more likely around a four, low fours to maybe low fives. Do you have an idea, Caitlin, on what some, you've, you've done a lot of work in forest soils. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, four to four point five range is is pretty typical. Um, there are some that are closer to five, but typically, and I've seen it below four as well. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that the maple trees are not healthy within those soils, but they would probably be even happier in a little bit higher pH. And why that's important when we come talk about pH is that pH is actually going to control the availability of nutrients within the soil. Uh, and so if you 
those nutrients might be there, but if the pH is off, then the nutrients aren't going to be available for the plants, especially when it comes to calcium. Um, you know, the pH is too low, the calcium might be in the soils, but it's not going to be available. And sugar maples, again, like a lot of um, calcium. And so if we want to change the pH, um, we can add lime, um, calcium carbonate. So it's adding calcium, which is helpful for the trees, but also alters the pH. So that's available for the plants to be able to take up in other nutrients as well. Um, and so there are producers who are doing some um, liming additions within their sugar bushes. The biggest challenge is getting equipment out there. Um, so especially if you're a large, um, you know, you've got several acres. If you don't have a lot of land, you know, it is, you, know, you can go out there and spread it around um, by hand or maybe a, a spreader on the back of a, a little ATV vehicle or something. Uh, there are some track machines that or pull behind machines that can be used that spread it a lot farther. Um, Quebec's been doing a lot more liming additions in their sugar bushes that they can use these machines that can shoot it out like 60 feet in either direction or more sometimes so they can get quite a bit of spread. Um, some of it also depends, depends on the topography. If you've got really steep hills, that makes it harder too versus working on flatter ground. Um, uh, Andrew asked the question is where do the pH for red maples prefer? Um, and they're around that same realm as well. Um, somewhere in the, you know, their ideal would be in that five to six and a half or so. Um, you don't want maybe a little bit lower, a little bit more on the acidic for red maples, but pretty close um, range also. So good question. Um, so where do the nutrients actually come from that are within our soils? Um, so a lot of them, especially calcium, is coming from the parent material, the bedrock. So within the soils, as those soils were formed from the bedrock material that was there, as it weathered away, um, that are releasing those nutrients in there, and they're taken up by plants. The plants decompose and add those nutrients back into the soil for other plants uh, to, to take up. So organic material is the other one as well, as those organic limbs and leaves decompose and stumps or other organisms decompose, nutrients are released back into the soil. Um, there are some nutrients that come from the atmosphere through either deposition or um, if we have our legumes that are able to use a fungus or a bacteria um, to help actually take atmospheric nitrogen, um, which typically is not happening in our forest uh, soils. Um, so if we think about what are the nutrients that are potentially limited in your sugar bush, um, nitrogen, uh, there's been some work and I've actually did some work on this a little bit that found that soils with higher nitrogen had higher, um, actually had higher sap sugar. Um, and that's because nitrogen is really important for photosynthesis. And so a lot of times plants would respond. You don't want to add too much into your soils, but plants typically respond to nitrogen. Um, they can usually always need more nitrogen, um, but not always the case. Uh, phosphorus, potentially, most of the studies have found that most sugar bushes are typically okay with phosphorus, but sometimes that may be necessary. Um, but a lot of studies have found for sugar maple health, not necessarily for maple production for sap production, uh, but that calcium is really important for maple health and regeneration and growth. Um, and so some studies that I did finding that calcium didn't actually increase sap sugar production, but in the long term, it'll it helps the growth of the trees and ultimately that'll help sugar production and will probably help the total sap volume too, because if you have better growth, you have more storage within the tree, you can get more sap um, also. And so sometimes when we add certain nutrients or do certain things like thinning, we may not see a direct benefit to that. And you might actually sometimes see a decrease in sugar um, production. And that's because the trees are putting more, now that they have this available nutrients, they're putting more growth and energy uh, or more energy into growth and they're growing bigger canopies. And so there may not be as much available sugars that we're getting, but if we wait long enough, um, then our sugars will actually go up because then they're gonna have bigger canopies at that time. <clears throat> 
Um, and then magnesium is one that if you test your sites, um, magnesium is similar to calcium that it could be lower. It could be helpful to have that within your soils as well. Um, and so how do we actually um, know whether we have a nutrient rich sugar bush or what our nutrient level is? You shouldn't just go out and add nutrients without doing a soil test um, first. So either doing a soil or foliage test or one um, step is to do indicator to look for indicator species, which I'll mention in a second. Um, but another question for you, Caitlin, um, since this is your field of working with soils with perennia, is it how is it doing a soils test? Um, and do they have to pay for that, or are there services for that in Nova Scotia? Yeah, there's a there's a lab at the um, it's a Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture lab um, that's at the Dalhousie Agriculture. Uh, campus um, and so you can take a soil sample and you can drop it off there and it's typically about a week to two week turnaround time depending on the season um, it does cost about thirty dollars per sample i think it's twenty seven dollars per sample um, but if you're a registered farm with the federation of agriculture it's half price um, and i can put the link to that in the chat as well where you would find the information for that great Good. Thank you, Caitlin. That's uh, helpful. So uh, just looking at the, the chat box, there's a question from Megan asking, how do maple maples do a silvo pasture um, type environments and that Megan's running chickens under the maples? Can the maples get too much nitrogen like garden plants? Um, they're probably most likely not going to get too much nitrogen just from your chickens. Um, I don't think there'd be too much in that sense. Uh, I would be a little bit more concerned about, I mean, chickens would probably be okay, but depends on how much scratching they're potentially doing. If they're um, scratching, if they're in a forest setting or in a yard setting, it's probably okay. In a forest setting, they might scratch around the leaves too much, which might dry out the soils easier potentially. Um, so that would be something that would be a little concerned about. So it depends on, you know, when it comes, I'm not an expert in silvopasture, but I know there's ways that silvopasturing can be done really well. And there's ways that silvopasturing can be done that it can be detrimental to the trees in the forest. Um, and so silvopasturing is not just letting cattle or pigs or sheep or chickens just run throughout a forest, um, but it's done in a, a certain way. Um, so I would just recommend that you make sure that you're following some other, you know, professional guidance on how that's done, but especially like cattle or pigs, like you know, that comes into that compaction of the soils and things like that, that they can be sometimes more harmful, not always, but can sometimes be harmful in a forest. So just mention that. Um, all right. Uh, so indicator species. So an indicator species is a plant that has a really narrow tolerance um, for its growing conditions. And so these are usually plants that like more nutrient rich soils that wouldn't grow in those sites if they're if it didn't have the specific characteristics that it wants. So if you see, you know, certain plants, like you see a willow, um, it's most likely growing in a really wet area or alder, it's gonna be growing in a wet site. Um, or, but some of those are based on having good nutrient rich sites. And so typically these are more herbaceous plants growing in our understory, kind of our spring wildflower type of things or ferns. And so, um, just a, a few different examples. One is a maidenhair fern. So if you see this maidenhair fern growing in your forest in the understory, then it's probably a fairly nutrient rich and you may not need to do any nutrient additions. Um, cohosh is another one that likes more nutrient rich sites. So where I see this in my forest are my more nutrient rich areas. Dutchman's breeches, squirrel corn, ginseng. Um, if you do happen to have ginseng, we don't have a lot of it in my uh, forests. There's some that we've planted um, here in our forest, um, but because our soils are lower in calcium and lower in pH, but usually good healthy maple forests with a lot of good calcium are going to have ginseng growing in there. Um, wood nettles, there's another usually good nutrient rich site. So that's one way to kind of tell um, how um, healthy your soils are within your forest. So other things to think about within the health of our trees in things that are impacting it. So we went over nutrients, um, thinking about our soils. Water availability is typically okay, um, but one of our biggest limiting factors in forest uh, 
grown maple trees is light availability. Um, that's one of the biggest ones that's going to be impacting um, those growth. And so as trees as they're growing, they're competing for that light, their canopies kind of crowd each other out. Um, and there's been studies that have found, you know, when we have larger canopies, we're going to have sweeter sap because bigger canopies, more leaves, more photosynthesis. Uh, if we do some thinning, that can sometimes increase um, sugar concentration, or it's going to help. We know thinning trees helps increase growth. Um, that's going to help sap volume, total longevity of those trees as well. Um, so thinning being taking out trees around it a little bit, removing some so that when it's really crowded, so that those trees can be larger. Um, healthy trees have higher photosynthesis. Um, so those are all kind of really important. That's going to help with higher sugar. And faster growing trees typically have sweeter sap and are more productive total sap volume as well. Um, and we've done some research at Cornell a little bit more recently. We're continuing to work on and finding kind of that similar things of thinning trees is really can be helpful. Um, so it's going to be different. You know, if you've got trees growing in your yard where the canopy is going to come all the way got down to the ground almost within a you know a few feet of the bottom, you know, you're going to have a lot of canopy. And those trees are usually much sweeter versus in your forest, although this is actually a fairly decent forest tree where this canopy does kind of come down. But this tree had been thinned around at one point because you can see it's not quite as wide. It's kind of a little bit more narrow. Um, so it has some open space around that tree to be able to grow more now. Um, so we want to encourage tree growth um, and doing this through vigorous crowns and healthy root systems. Um, so a good productive crown is going to have low transparency, meaning that you know, if you're standing on the ground and you look up at the canopy in the summertime when the leaves are out, that you don't have big gaps within that canopy, that it's kind of filling in and utilizing all the light potential that's within that canopy space uh, within the forest. And then we also want to have a good high live crown ratio, um, which is the height of the canopy. I'll show you that in a second. And then good high crown width ratio so that um the width of that canopy is nice and wide. And so one indicator to look at our maple trees to see, you know, how healthy are our maple trees is to look at our tap holes from previous seasons to see how quickly they're closing up as it's putting on growth rings. Those growth rings are closing around and will grow over top of our old tap holes. And so if you look at a tree, you should have your tap holes closing within Nova Scotia, probably within three seasons. Some areas can close, you know, if you get a good growing tree, it'll close completely in one year. Um, but within my forest, which is similar kind of growing conditions somewhat to what you have in Nova Scotia, you should be closing in um, within three years. And if not, then your tree is probably not growing quite as quickly. So if we look at this tree on the left, and so I put little paint dots below my tap holes when I pull them so you can see, um, so these tap holes here, that's only a couple of years old, that one has closed up completely. This one's really grown. And then that bark is starting to split as that tree gets larger on the inside, the bark is cracking, which is naturally part of that tree. And you can see, so that's opening up lots of good growth. And that's a tap hole that's uh, probably more like five years old in this picture versus this picture on the right. If we, as we look at those tap holes, we can still see like a perfect round circle and you could take a a pencil and kind of push all the way into those holes because there really isn't good growth on that tree. It's not closing those up. So that's not an actively healthy tree. You may not want to even be tapping that. That might be good firewood for cooking down your maple syrup. Um, so going back to the live crown ratio, what that's referring to is the percentage of the trees. So we look at the total height, total height of the tree from the very top of the canopy all the way to the ground. What percent of that total height is makes up the actual canopy of the tree? And so um, if we drew a line, you know, in this case at the bottom of the canopy here, looking at what percentage of this compared to the whole length of that tree um, is actual the live crown ratio. And a higher live crown ratio means a deeper canopy, um, more um, more productive, more photosynthesis happening. You know, if you've got an open grown tree, it's going to be 80% or more of that tree is going to have an 80% live crown ratio. Where in a forest, it could be somewhere from 10 to maybe 50%. 50% is going to be high, but a really crowded forest is only going to be 10, 15%. Um, where uh, trees that have a little bit room to grow might be more around like 
30 percent 25 30 which is a little more ideal for a maple sugar bush um, you can see this one here is a little bit deeper where in this particular case uh, we can't quite see all the way down to the ground you know in here we're probably only 15 to 20 percent but in this particular case we're probably 30 35 percent um, which is much better deeper live crown ratio um, so it's good to monitor your crown health. Um, we're talking about crown is talking to one individual tree. So the actual um, foliar area on that tree versus the canopy um, can refer to one tree, but a lot of times it's referring to all of the trees um, within there, the whole entire canopy collectively together. Um, in a closed sugar bushes, the crown diameter, so the width of that crown is oftentimes the best predictor of the sap sugar concentration so how sweet those trees are larger diameter crowns are going to be sweeter so less competition on the sides with other trees um in more open grown trees the live crown ratio so the width because they have more light coming all the way down so how deep that canopy is is more of a predictor um and the sap flow so total volume of sap that we get from a tree is oftentimes predicted by the crown size and also the stem diameter as well bigger stems bigger crowns more sap uh, typically. So if we are going to thin our trees, um, that doesn't mean go out there and cut everything that's not a maple and then you thin your trees. That's not thinning your trees. That's creating a monoculture, which is not a healthy forest. We want to have a diversity of species. Diversity of species is going to create a diversity of microbes within our soils. And it's also good that's going to create healthier soils, but it's also going to create healthier um, forest because if you have a pest come in like forest tent caterpillar um, it's going to go after maybe your birch trees or cherry trees that you left before it goes after our maples and so having a diversity um, is good we recommend typically that we actually want to have 75 percent maples and 25 percent non-maples um, you know if you can at least get five, 10 percent of bare minimum, um, that's a good start. But we don't want to cut everything and only leave maples. It's OK to cut out some maples if they're not healthy and they're competing with other trees, um, and especially if they're going to split or something's going to happen to them in the future. Anyways, it's good to take them out. Um, depending on the age of the trees that you have there, but in a little bit more mature, we typically want to have somewhere around 70 to 100 trees per acre. Um, if they're smaller trees can be higher density, maybe 120, um, it works out to be somewhere, you know, when you've got somewhere around 80 trees per acre, it works out roughly about 22 feet spacing on center. Not that every tree is going to be that spacing, but just kind of an average from standing at one tree to the next tree is going to be about that far apart. Um, the trees we want to keep are the high vigor, the low risk trees. So a single stem, if you've got a tree that's splitting into two stems and it's got a weak attachment where those attach together, what we call a V crotch, um, where uh, the bark kind of grows together. And so it's not a strong attachment versus if it's more rounded crotch, U-shaped, those are much stronger and okay. So it looks like, you know, one of those stems could break out in a windstorm. Um, or it's got a sugar maple bore that's going to be a weak point or some kind of burr or something that could be a weak point that could break. You know, you might want to remove those. You know, the really tiny canopies, get those out of there. Um, if you are doing buckets, if you know those are trees with sweeter, sweeter sap, you know, favor your more sweeter sap trees um, that are in there. Um, so bigger trees respond well. Sugar maples that are larger respond well to thinning. So, you know, that doesn't mean you have to cut all your big ones and leave the smaller ones to grow in. Um, keeping big ones room to grow can be helpful. Um, question from Andrew asking what time of the year is best for thinning? Um, the, the biggest thing is making sure you're not disturbing the soil. So you don't want to be doing it when it's wet. Um, and so the, the winter time is actually the best time to thin because it's doing the least amount of damage to the soil and it's going to do the least amount of damage to other trees around if you're removing those trees. Um, the problem with doing it in the wintertime is that's when we want to be in there tapping. Um, if you have an existing tubing system and you got to remove some of that to go in and thin, usually don't want to do that in the wintertime because it's harder to get in there. So uh, late fall is best um, if you care about songbirds and nesting songbirds you usually don't want to do it between like may and end of june when they're nesting um so something else to maybe keep in mind so winter time is always typically the best if you can get in there when there's good 
frozen ground or snow on the ground. Um, but fall can be good if it's dry. And summer can be fine as well. Um, just some last couple of concepts to think about this and that if we're managing for timber versus a sugar bush, there's managed a little bit different. So if you're working with like a forester or something like that, that there are some different principles in a timber forest. We don't usually want a really high live crown ratio because branches coming all the way down and canopies that are kind of branching out lower down is not good for a good saw log. Where in a timber, we want a real nice long straight saw log with a canopies being a little bit smaller-ish at the top so we can get a log all the way up further versus in our sugar bush we want these canopies coming down a little bit deeper um, within there so they are managed a little bit different but some of the same principles can apply and what's really important is to think about the future of your forest and making sure that you have regeneration meaning that you have new forest um, that are coming new trees that are coming in to replace trees um, and that's not um, just little ones. I'm showing little ones here, but at different stages um, within your forest. And um, if we are thinning, um, you typically, if we're looking at this, we a lot of times think about if we're doing individual tree thinning, you know, kind of crop tree where we're picking a tree and we want to thin around it. Um, we a lot of times look at what sides are free to grow. Um, so in this particular case, there's no sides of this canopy. We're looking at the orange or the blue one in the middle here. Um, if we split this up into quadrants, how many quarters are free to grow? How many sides are free to grow? In this case, they're all crowded in with other trees. Um, where in this case, um, if we thin around it or this tree has all of its sides are free to grow. You know, this is optimum, but you know, in your maple trees, but they will crowd together and it's okay. Um, but we just Typically don't want all of that. We want some sides that are free to grow. Um, and smaller trees are gonna respond better to complete kind of four-sided release um, to release all the sides because they're a little bit smaller. They're gonna expand into that a little bit more. We typically don't wanna do that in larger trees. Um, they may actually be um, kind of shocked by that if you thin too heavy. Um, there can sometimes be some skun skull. You're opening up the forest floor a little bit different. Um, but even more importantly, when you've got these trees that have been used to growing um, tight together in a canopy, that they kind of all support each other if there's wind events, where if you open that up and now it's standing by itself, there's potential of wind throw. And so in larger trees, you usually only want to release about two, maybe three sides of that tree. Um, all right, so that's a uh, sugar bush kind of management, kind of some real basic concepts to think about. Um, if you have questions about that, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna move on to just thinking about um, some more advanced kind of tapping concepts to think about, um, and that's tap hole sanitation. Um, and tap hole sanitation is referring to um, your, obviously your tap hole and the cleanliness of that, but making sure that microbes from your tubing or your spouts don't get back in that tree. So we think all the way back to, uh, I think it was the first webinar that we had, where we talked about the pressure that's created within the trees and that pressure within the trees is what allows the sap to flow out. But then there was also that vacuum that happens um, when it gets cold and dips into freezing that there's a little bit of vacuum that happens that pulls the groundwater into the trees. And what can actually happen is within, especially if we're using a tubing system and we have that into the tree and then there's tap within that spout um, and that drop line of the tubing, when it goes into vacuum, it can suck a little bit of that sap back up into the tap hole. And if there are microbes in that tubing, like we can see in this tubing here where it's all dirty, that can pull back into the tap hole, but also just even if you're using buckets that tap just from the environment, microbes and things can get into that tap hole. Or if your spout is not clean or not new and that's put in there, especially the plastic being microporous, um, that the microbes that are in there in that tap hole now, and now you have this nice sugary um, liquid and humid environment. That is what microbes, especially yeast, love to grow in. So they'll start to multiply and they'll actually plug up the cells of the wood and that will restrict our flow. So later in the season, we'll start to see production actually drop off the last half or last third of our season 
from that microbial growth, especially if you had some warmer spells. You know, as long as it's cold, you'd be okay. But if you got some warmer weather during your sap season, that micro growth is really going to increase. So we want to do different practices to try to keep that tap hole as clean as possible so that we can get the most amount of flow from that tree and it doesn't plug up by microbes. And so the way we do that, a um, few different options. One mechanical is to put, so having vacuum on our tubing can kind of pull that vacuum is usually stronger than the vacuum of the tree and helps that from sucking back, but it's not perfect. Um, especially, you know, if your spout is dirty, that's into the tree and microbes are gonna grow. Um, but also maybe that helps, but if you had some sap that froze up in the line, that's going to cut that vacuum now. And now anything beyond that um, can still suck back into the tree. So it's not perfect. Um, so actually sanitizing, um, going out there and doing a sanitation and cleaning your tubing. It'll just cover in a, in a bit. Um, and then the other one is material replacement. So either replacing the tubing or drop line or putting a new spout on. So using a new spout, every year. And so just as a comparison, if you're using old spouts year after year without any cleaning and drop lines, um, you're probably going to get um, less than half the amount of sap than you would uh, of around half the amount of sap than if you did a brand new spout or brand new drop line, um, but or clean this particular research shows um, cleaning with chlorine. Um, or there's uh, isopropyl alcohol that you can clean with as well. And so even if we had an old drop line, but a new spout, that makes all the difference. You're going to get at least 20, 30% more sap by just having a clean spout. And so as we see, this is kind of progressing through the season, this graph in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you know, they start out kind of similar production, but as we progress through the season, the dirty, the pink line there, um, the old spouts and drops just kind of flattens out where that the new clean drops and spouts continues to produce um, and doesn't flatten out at all. Um, this is a some study that was several kind of studies um, put together um, that looked at different sort of methods. So just adding a new spout was 30% more sap. Um, nothing with the drop line, just a brand new spout every year um, gave you 30% more. Um, a check valve spout is a spout that has a little ball in it that prevents sap from coming back up into the tree. So using a new spout, um, so that's going to give you, you know, at least 20, 30% by having that. But then that check valve will prevent any of the dirty um, microbes from the tubing coming back in. That gave 70% more. New spout and drop was around 70, 75%. Um, the chlorine sanitation, similar, so cleaning that. So it might be an old drop line and old spout by cleaning it. It's helpful. Peroxide was not helpful with cleaning. Isopropyl alcohol sanitation is helpful in cleaning that. So it could be, again, an old spout and drop line. But if we can clean them, um, then we can get them pretty close back to a new or just as good as new. Um, so the common application that's used, um, at least in Canada, unfortunately, we're not allowed to use this in the U.S. It's not approved for food grade use. Um, but in Canada, you can, and it is used um, readily around the maple industry is isopropanol alcohol, IPA. Um, you want to make sure that it is registered by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to be used for um, food sanitation, food surface sanitation. Um, be careful that this is a flammable product. Um, so uh, be careful in where you store it and how you use it. Um, also, another thing that's important is making sure that you're using 70% isopropanol alcohol. You don't want to go for 90% or 95% thinking that, well, more is better. Um, it actually the microbes can actually create like defense mechanisms when it gets too high. So 70% is the, the best level to be. And that's most commonly what you'll get anyways. Um, you do technically need to rinse this through your tubing system. What most people do, most producers, is just let your first little bit of run of sap go through and dump that on the ground. And that, which usually is not good anyways, that rinses the lines and then it's good to go. Um, the way this is done is typically using a like a backpack little sprayer with an injector. You go up to your drop line or your in your spout and you shoot uh, 15 milliliters per spout or drop line into that, either 
keeping your vacuum on low so it doesn't suck it all the way down through, but sucks it in just a little bit or vacuum off. Um, so it stays within the drop line and then you cap it off. And what happens is that isopropyl alcohol is actually um, forming gas and releasing the gas that gets, even if it's that, you know, if you cap this off and all the um, alcohol is not connected with every little bit of the tubing, the gases are going to vaporize throughout that tubing and help sterilize everything. Um, what's really important though, is if you're going to clean your spouts is um, and reuse your spouts year after year. So in the US, because we don't use isopropyl alcohol, we actually cut off our spouts at the end of the season. And we put a brand new one on every year, which takes a lot of work um, and it's material costs and plastic waste and all that. Um, and so if you are, um, but it would use an isopropyl alcohol actually does a really good job of cleaning it fully, but it's important that you choose the right tea fitting or you sterilize that in the proper way. Um, so there's different tea fittings that our drop lines connect into. Um, if you get these style with a pin where the spout maybe just goes into this pin at the end, then there's no way that the outside and even parts of the inside of that spout will actually fully be cleaned. Also, if you get these really short cupped ones that are right, that get an opening, but it doesn't get the full outside of the spout to make sure that the gases come up around and clean that spout entirely. These longer tubes are better, but I'm still not a big fan of them for the isopropyl alcohol because they can sometimes leak out. And so the gas vapors escape before it actually sanitizes them. Because if the spout is not made, if you have the right spout for that manufacturer, that could be okay. But if you replace your spouts in five years, then it might be different. Um, so this is the idea is that that spout could go down. This part isn't in contact within the tree. This part that is. So it seals off and up there. And then the gases that's going to be in this drop line it come down in the spout will come up around the outside. Um, there's one company makes these little plastic, these rubbery kind of caps that go over top of that. Those work well because that helps seal that. Um, so that's one option. Um, so we want to make sure that gas from the isopropyl alcohol is not going to leak out. Another option is the sanitary caps um, that kind of hang from your tubing that you put it down into. So those are probably one of the better options, um, but it is an added cost. Um, so that's just uh, some concepts to kind of think about if you really want to maximize your production, even if you're doing buckets, you can just soak them in some isopropyl alcohol, um, rinse them, and then reuse them. You know, even isopropyl alcohol to kind of clean your buckets can be good too to keep microbes out of your, you know, the sap. So rinse, uh, wipe them with, clean them, wipe them, and then rinse them out uh, with that. All right. Uh, if there's any questions about that, feel free to throw them into the chat. And if not, the last little bit I want to wrap up is just thinking about some overall kind of planning your operation and marketing your product. So just some real basic concepts on this, um, not getting too in depth. Um, one options maybe in your plan that you want to think about is potentially leasing trees um, from other landowners. So that is an option. Um, that a lot of maple producers take advantage of. So instead of going out and purchasing land or there's no opportunities for purchasing land, but maybe there's a landowner nearby who would be willing to lease trees to you, or maybe you're a landowner who's only tapping a few trees and wants to lease some of your trees to somebody else. Um, could be a cost-effective way to add taps in depending on the price um, and depends on the location. Usually you don't want to go too far, but look, you know, within 15 kilometers of your sugar house, you know, are there more trees that could be tapped? Um, big thing is making sure if you do tap trees that you want to usually have at least a 10 year lease. Um, you don't want to be, you know, if you're putting in a two eat system, if you're just going in hanging buckets, then it doesn't matter, you know, but handshake might be fine. But if you're putting in a tubing system and investing in that, um, you want to usually have a contract, work with a lawyer, and um, do a long term. Um, but really think about the logistics of hauling sap. It can be really expensive if you're hauling sap a long ways. Um, but short distance isn't too bad. 
Um, so usually the average rate is around a dollar uh, per tap per year. You can base this more on production numbers though, or percentage of yield or give syrup back, um, different ways to be creative with that. Um, price is usually going to depend on what's the demand in the area. If there's a lot of people that want to lease trees, then the price is going to be higher typically. Um, how easy is it? How healthy are those trees? How many maples are within there? Um, you know, what obstacles you have to overcome? What are the roadways? Can you get into it easily? Do you have to do a lot of work in there? Um, you know, how much are you going to have to invest into it? Um, so sap prices are based solely on the sugar concentration of the sap and the volume. So it's not just a good flat rate um, per gallon of sap or whatever, a liter for sap. It's going to be based on how sweet that sap is because that's going to translate into how much syrup we can make. Um, so whether you're buying or selling sap, um, that prices should be based on how sweet that sap is and then what's the bulk price for syrup um, that given year. Uh, I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then that we're kind of giving a percentage of that syrup price um, is provided back to the sap seller. And then quality of that sap is going to be really important what's produced from it as well. And so we use the bulk syrup price. So bulk price is when syrup is sold by the pound in large containers. This is the bare flat minimum. Um, when we're talking about retail prices of maple syrup, there's added costs because we're purchasing bottles. We're taking time to bottle it, put labels on, we're creating, you know, we have to go to market, farmer's markets or things like that. That's a lot, all added costs. And so obviously we're getting more value for that syrup, but it's going to cost more. So when we're thinking about syrup, are selling sap, we want to base it on what's the value of that syrup just as a bulk, because that's the flat rate of the commodity before we've done anything else um, with bottling, anything like that, that's going to fluctuate the price. So we base it on that bulk rate. Um, most commonly, it's around a 50-50 split of the value of what that syrup would make. So we calculate you know, the sap sugar, the sap volume, how much syrup would that make? And usually you give about half of it to the sap producer and the syrup producer keeps about half. Uh, depends a little bit on the size of the operation, how easily is it for them to process it and who's hauling it. If the sap producer, person who's actually tapping the trees is hauling it, then maybe more of like a 60-40 split might be better um, versus a 50-50 split if the syrup producer is going and picking it up and depends on how haul, how far it's being hauled. Um, and, or you can just give back syrup in payment is a great option as well. Um, so just a, a couple, just topics on business planning. Um, I'm not a, an economist or business expert, um, but just some real basic principles to think about, which I know can really be daunting and scary. And my wife and I run a, a small, um, vegetable and cut flower farm and have a little farm stand. Um, and so delve into this a little bit and it can be kind of, you know, scary to think about or seems like a lot of work. Um, but I wanted to throw it out there that with some of these principles, you know, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to create a giant um, 50 page business plan or anything like that. But just it is good to kind of create some strategies and put down some thoughts and ideas and goals in mind um, when doing this. And one good way to start sometimes is to do a SWOT analysis. Um, sometimes I get annoyed because people talk about SWOT analysis a lot if you're in certain fields, and uh, but they are actually helpful. So SWOT analysis, if you're not familiar with, is a strength, looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So, you know, what, you know, strengths do you have or does your maple operation have? So, you know, maybe you have a really good stand of maple trees. Um, that's healthier. You've got lots of family that's going to help you tap your trees and make maple syrup, um, or you have some equipment already in place. You're trained, you know, you've gone through these webinars. That's a strength. You've got some, you know, some knowledge on what to do, but, you know, then what are weaknesses? You know, maybe there's a lot of, um, you know, you don't have as much help or you need more, you know, equipment, um, that's out there. You're not sure what markets are available and how it would sell, you know, you know then what are your opportunities um, that are there? You know, what markets are potentially available for selling your syrup and then what threats, you know, maybe there's competing markets or, you know, you're in your forests are maybe not as healthy or you've got some invasive species in your forest or 
prone to more wind areas, that could be a threat as well. So identifying those can be important, you know, as you're planning out maybe a maple operation. Um, and, you know, creating kind of a strategic plan can be good. And again, these can be just a couple ideas just jotted down on paper of, you know, whether it's a mission statement, which again, doesn't have to be this formal mission statement that you're publishing on your website or every bottle of maple syrup, but really just jotting down what are your goals? You know, what is, what's important to you, you know, and whether that you want to be the best maple producer in Nova Scotia, or you just want something to keep you busy, or you have this goal of being able to establish this business that you can pass down to family members, or you want to make money off this, you know, what is the goal? What, what's kind of makes you tick? What gets you excited? Um, you know, what do you ultimately want us to do? And a good thing to think about that is where do you want to be in 10 years? You know, if you are tapping, whether this is a business or you're just doing it as a hobby, as you get into it or are doing it, where do you want to be in 10 years? You know, do you want to be a large producer? Do you want to just be tapping 10 trees to make syrup to give away to friends and family? Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, what you you kind of know where you want to go, where your goals are, what's important to you for your quality of life and your family life, what's important that way, then maybe work backwards and create a roadmap that's going to get you to that particular goal. Um, and then kind of your operations plans, you know, as you're thinking about, again, keeping it basics of, you know, what products are you going to, you know, create? Are you just doing syrup? Or are you going to do some value added products? Are you going to make maple cream or maple butter, maple candies? Um, and so, you know, how are you going to develop those? Um, how much are you going to make, um, for that? What's your market's going to be? How are you going to grow and get to that point? Um, having a finance plan is important, you know, just again, we don't have to have this giant plan, but just thinking about, you know, what money do we have available to purchase equipment or do we need to borrow money for that? Um, but then, you know, what's, what even beyond that, what's most important is really just keeping track of your income and expenses. So having a system, it doesn't have to be great, whether it's just a little notebook that you write down, you know, if you went to a market or you have a roadside stand, you know, how much money did you make that day? Um, and then, you know, keeping track of your expenses, you know, or, you know, doing a spreadsheet, whatever works best for you, but having a system and not um, trying to be organized with it and keeping track of any of your expenses, whether that's putting in a shoebox or something, which is not always the most ideal, but at least it's better than not knowing where they are. Or, you know, if you're purchasing things online, having a folder in your, your email. So when that receipt comes in that you can put your expenses into. So when you come back to at the end of the year to look at your income and expenses or do taxes or anything like that, you have that available. So just having some kind of system in place that works for you and works that, you know, doing it at a time of day that's maybe convenient for you, that it doesn't become a chore. And maybe you have a, you know, a few minutes that you can set aside. Um, and when we think about markets, um, do some market research. You know, how do you stack up? How does it compare? You know, identify the markets you want to go for just because, you know, if people are selling maple syrup at farmer's markets, don't follow everybody else and just start selling at farmer's markets. But, you know, maybe they're selling syrup. Maybe I can create something different. Maybe I want a maple soda or maple marshmallows that I want to sell at those farmer's markets. How can we do something different and create kind of your own niche market um, out of that, but know what your market is going to be and then set realistic um, prices um, that are based on your cost. Um, so one resource, we have some business planning um, resources available at cornellmaple.com at our website, but a, a really good resource that I'd like to point people to for business planning um, for maple operations is the University of Vermont. Um, Mark Canella, who is a maple or is a kind of farm business specialist and economist. And so he's created some really nice tools. And that website is maplemanager.org. Um, and so you can access some of those tools that are on there. Um, and so I will end off with just thinking that um, with this quote, which was from an advertisement used from a maple operation that was around in the late 1800s, not too far from my operation, that said that the nature is the greatest chemist and we can do no more than retain the flavor created in the laboratory of the woods.
Uh, I think that's kind of a, a cool scene, you know, reflecting how, you know, mate, the, the trees and the forests are doing all the work. Uh, we just got to make sure we capture that and turn that into a good quality syrup product. So I'll turn it over for any questions that folks might have. Hey, thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A, or if you do want to um, ask your question out loud, uh, there should be a button where you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. I'll give you a few minutes here to type out or think of any questions that you have. Um, and while we late, uh, wait, I would like to formally uh, thank you so much, Adam, for these webinars. They were very informative. Um, and again, we'll have the recordings of these webinars available on the Perennia YouTube page, as well as the Perennia website. Um, and obviously, Adam's contact information is there. Um, I also posted my email in the chat if you have any questions. Um, about uh, particularly soil, but also um, I can always reach out to Adam with any maple specific questions. Yeah. And you're becoming a maple expert now too. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but feel free, my, my contact information, both email and phone is there. Um, so feel free if you've got you know specific questions about things, um, whether it's now or it's in six months or a year more, and you know you come across something that you're unsure about that um, you need help with or you want clarification, feel free to, to reach out to me with any questions you might have um, in the future as they come up when you're maple experience. <laughs>